So yes, let's is this game where you have a partner or maybe two or three people and one person will say like, let's skip down the street. And the only thing everyone else is allowed to say is yes, let's, and then you do it. All right. And then the next person is like, let's roll down the hill and their partners have to do that too. So it's like this improv game, but we use it in my work to kind of illuminate um, the way that play can activate the body in such a way that the mind cannot. So it's kind of a good way of getting adults to play. It is, right? and, and what part of your work do you implement that's this game and how does it look like? So this is done in forest therapy guide training. And in the training, we're trying to train people to help others kind of get out of their mind and into their body. So to shift attention from cognitive process into embodied process. Mm. And play has this miraculous ability to do this without any effort. It's kind of like meditation where like, if I tell you like, all right, meditate until you achieve enlightenment, then the objective of achieving enlightenment is so front and center on your mind that you can't stop thinking about it and mm -hmm. it becomes an impediment. Yeah. Kind of like telling someone to fall asleep too. It's like yeah. fall asleep right now. And the more you think about it, the further away you get. Or don't be sad. Right, don't be sad. So telling people to play or not telling them to play, but inviting them to play kind of, slowly opens them into this kind of childlike ability to just lean into whatever is happening without evaluating or judging it. Because mm. that's kind of what adults tend to do, right? It's like, let's skip down the street. Well, what does that look like? Am I doing it right? Why are we doing this? This makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm. So we have all these ways that we can block ourselves from experience that the body is probably very interested in doing, but the mind can kind of just put a block down on it. All right. I, I, I read a book about storytelling. I think uh, the author's name is uh, Karen Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was telling, uh, she, she was writing about this study. They studied kids uh, during play and they realized that um, 80% of the themes in, in the kids play were, were dark themes like violence and, and trying to, to process the, the unknown. It was themes like revenge and kidnapping and death and murder. So one of the reasons, uh, one of the layers of play was to help kids to, or kids actually helping themselves to process existence. Right. And and then she kept writing about, so she, she was asking herself, so what happens with this kind of process or the need for this process when we grow up? Well, the need is still there. We need to right. process the, the chaos of existence. But how do we do that? Because we stop play. Right. Right? So, so, so her, uh, she was thinking that we do it through pop culture, through stories. Right. Like watching, like watching really dark uh, criminal series or, or murder movies or, or like really dark uh, and and uh, violence, uh, reading dark and violent books to process that. Right. So I don't I don't necessarily think that the the need for play stops uh, when you grow up, but maybe like the processes or the meta processes around it changes, and you need to like up update the manual right. for play. Well, play is fundamentally about learning, so it's just a different way of learning in a wide range of pedagogical approaches. So mm. like in our traditional school system, we use a lot of a very narrow approach, which is teacher centered and just like read the book, take the test, get the answers right, move on. Mm. Whereas play is not, uh, it's infinite. Like it's about possibilities. It's not about getting to the end. There's this wonderful book on game theory where the author talks about finite and infinite games. And so a finite game is something where there's usually a winner and a loser. And the point of the game is to end it with someone being the winner. But an infinite game is about finding ways to make the game keep going. Right. And he says, everything we do as humans can be thought of as a game that you're playing. In one way or another, there are rules and systems to everything from you know finance to work to relationships and all these things. Yeah. But that relationships are fundamentally infinite games because like the point of my friendship with you isn't to perfect it and get to the end and I win the game and now we're friends, right? right. <laughs> or we're friends on my terms. Like an infinite game purposely kind of obfuscates this idea that there are winners and losers in process. So as we learn and, and when we're exploring those kind of dark images, that's also learning about things that kind of the, the dominant culture tends to obfuscate from the heart. Like we have ways of grappling with this from an intellectual perspective, but we don't have the cultural tools to be approaching that kind of heart-centered learning around themes like grief and loss and violence and mm. things that are endemic to reality, 
but we don't process them. Uh, so, so building on that, I would say that, that a debate is a finite game and a dialogue is an infinite game. Exactly. Right? Right. Yeah. I never thought about that uh, in that way. So, and, 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 I, and I hear by just listening to you that play is very central for you. In a way, I mean, I think play is just another word for self-direction. Like, play is a, is a way of, of exploring. It, like, the word play in the English language, I think, gets easily pigeonholed into thinking about, like, this is about children's mm -hmm. play, but the concept of play can be applied more widely than just talking about, like, soccer or video games or, you know, uh, make-believe imaginary games. Like, if we apply the concept of play, that curiosity to whatever we're doing, uh, then you're playing, you know? And, and the play is where the creativity comes because it's not about outcomes. It's like uh, jazz, you know? When you listen to someone that is playing jazz, they're improvising. They're figuring something out that's expressed in the moment. And it's not like they're just trying to nail the notes on the page and execute them perfectly. But what I'm thinking is that jazz, I love that you brought that metaphor to the, to the table because jazz is also based on the fact that you know what you're doing. Yes, well, so you have to be a good instrumentalist. Yes, so yes. there's a fundam, there's like this base of knowledge. Yes. And when you've done your 10,000 hours, and then you can play, right? One of my mentors loves jazz, and one of his favorite things to explain about it is that basically jazz, you need to know how to start the song and you need to know how to end the song. And all the people on stage have to have a collective understanding of how to get into the play and how to get out of the play. And that in the middle, you don't need to know what's going to happen, it's just going to happen. But that's kind of like what I was talking about with thresholds, right? That like, you need to know how to get into the process, then you need to have freedom to do whatever is going to happen without any judgment, without any coercion, or without anyone kind of stepping up and saying like, I'm in charge now, this is what we're doing. And then collectively, you all also need to know how to exit that space, how to say, okay, the play has concluded now. And then hopefully at the end, you've harvested something beautiful from that expression. Or maybe the beauty of that expression was just real in that moment. And then that's it. It doesn't have to be anything afterwards. Hmm. I, I went to this uh, course uh, this weekend in Sweden called uh, Authentic Relating. Do you know that? No. It's, it's, a, it's a way, it's a method to, to help people to deepen the authenticity and the intimacy of their relationships. And we did this game. It was basically the whole weekend was based on games. We did 10 games. Okay. And one game was called the game game. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they paired us up and in, in, uh, they grouped us in, 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 three, in threes. And, and what we did was in the game game, every person was, was given 10 minutes to decide a game. Like any game you wanted to do. You could just create this bubble, this scenario where everyone... Uh, was invited to play the game as you wanted it to be. And then they invited us to, to, to let the, the other participants know what kind of game we wanted to play. So what is this game? And when does it start? When does it stop? And what are the rules? Right. So that was the game game. Mm. Um, and it, it, I, I was reminded by, by uh, what we were talking about right now uh, of that game because... It gave the, the, the possibility for one person to get what they needed, right. but in a playful way, and invite the others to support him or her. Uh, and that was, it, it, it was both a learning, learning experience, but, but mostly it was a connecting experience. Because what I saw was uh, me and the other participants inviting each other to very vulnerable and sensitive places, but in a playful way, so it felt more safe. Right. Yeah, I definitely noticed that when we do this kind of play exercise on training, that in some ways it's like people revert to a very innocent, vulnerable place. Yeah. And you reach out to people very quickly because there's this camaraderie in playing the game that is essential to the, like, the quality or the phenomenon of play, that you're doing it with these other people. And that's not to say you can't do play with yourself, but that when you do it in a social setting, uh, it's like those barriers between people melt very quickly. Yeah. And otherwise people can feel very, you know, uh, 
kind of uh, hesitant to be yeah. vulnerable in that way because they don't know if it's safe. Protective almost, yes. right? Because if I don't, hmm, it's like if I'm afraid to lose, right? Uh, I might not I, I might not share or, or or invite you to my most vulnerable places. Right. And that's just like a huge commentary on relationships. Yeah. That like if we're going to teach people how to have relationships, there's an inherent risk and vulnerability mm. in having those relationships and that the quality of a relationship isn't about its beginning and ending, it's about what did you learn? Yeah. How was it transformative or healing? Yeah, and and also I I don't want to uh, I I don't want to um, like, put it uh, too 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 much of a negative uh, uh, approach on uh, finite games. I mean, sometimes we 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 want to uh, know who's the winner and who's the loser. But but I think m- mainly maybe uh, it would be valuable to to know uh, when we're playing a finite game and when we're playing an infinite game, so we don't mix those up. Right. Huh. And and. <laughs> I'm I'm also while we're talking I'm imagining or actually I'm I'm curious about um because we talk a, a lot about play and I'm also curious about to talk to you about um education and knowledge and wisdom but I would like to know how Ben was like in school <laughs> who wh- what kind of guy were you in school um well I went to public school, K through 12. Uh, Where? In Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. which as a state um, has a very strongly well-funded public education sector. Um, I had a very good education in the public sector in my home state. Um, I was always interested in things that weren't being taught in school, which I always thought was really annoying. I was definitely someone that... uh, played the game well. Mm. I think I understood from an early age that there, you know, that classroom style learning is a game and that you can play the game and manipulate your teachers and do all sorts of little things. I think one of my favorite tactics was like the ability to get someone to bump you up from a B plus to an A minus when you're, you know, half a point shy. And it's like there are ways, you know, you, you ask for extra credit or, or you show them how, how dedicated you are to the subject matter, but that there's just this, there's this game of kind of an emotional manipulation of how teachers and students work with each other. Hmm. I think it's interesting thinking about uh, like most of my education where there was a camaraderie among the students that was very much against the teachers. And there was always this idea that the teachers were kind of, you know, not such great people or, they were controlling or abusive of their power in some sense, and it was us versus them, Mm. which is not a particularly healthy learning environment. But I did have some really excellent teachers in my public school education, all of whom at the time were probably in their 60s and were not trained in the same way that teachers today are trained. So these people did not have a master's degree in education or a teaching certificate. They were just really smart people and they understood a pedagogical approach that worked. I had this one, uh, my AP US history teacher, Lisa Peck, we were learning about the civil rights movement and this was in 2002, um, right after the Iraqis started burning their oil fields in retreat of the advancing US forces, uh, we staged a protest at my school. So we walked out of school and I thought I was gonna be really slick. And so I said to Ms. Peck, you know, I feel like I'm doing learning here about civil rights because I'm involved in organizing this walkout. And she said, well, I'm still gonna give you this cut slip because you know, if Martin Luther King had said, well, you know, I'm doing a good thing so I shouldn't have any punishment, then it would have been easy. And that things aren't easy when you're trying to change society. So you need to accept the punishment that goes along with your choice. Hmm. You know, and so there were learning moments like that, which were non-curricular, but were really formative. I had this other amazing teacher who was like this total hippie (laughs) and we read Walden's Thoreau. I grew up about like uh, three quarters of a mile from Walden Pond. So we read the last chapter of his book at the site of Thoreau's cabin at sunrise. And at the end of that, um, Bill Schechter was his name, the teacher. He said, well, I have to go to work because I'll be fired if I don't show off. But you're all seniors in high school. You should cut class and just take a walk around the pond. So he encouraged us not to go to school. And there were teachers like that in my education who really understood that 
the individual learner had their own process. And that, that process was mediated by personal choice and interest and passion, and that you had to open that door for people. And I still played the game very well. I went to a very competitive elite liberal arts college, and then I did my master's degree at an institution that was like the exact opposite of my college experience, my undergrad. Um, my graduate experience was at Pacific Oaks College, which is here in Pasadena. And it's 97% women, 95% people of color. Mm. So as the only white guy in the room, um, I had uh, a, like a revelatory, earth shattering <laughs> educational experience in that setting because the way we were learning was about sharing our personal stories. I was studying human development and social change, but the pedagogical approach was that we were learning about each other. And through that, we were learning about things like race and class and gender. So I always think I got more out of that than maybe anyone else in the room because I came in super ignorant. <laughs> was, was that a new approach for you to, to share your personal experience in that way? Yeah, because most academic settings aren't about our personal experiences. Most academic situations, we're talking about other people's thoughts and opinions right. and debating them. We're not bringing the wisdom of our own personal journey to the table as a, as a pedagogical approach. Mm, right. So, so when you look back on your, on your, on your uh, educational journey, um, if you were able to go back and change anything, what, what, what did you lack? What, what wasn't there for you? Hmm. I mean, I guess the thing that I felt always was lacking was that I didn't have time Like my life was very, well, at least K through 12, there was school and then homework and then sports and theater and music. And it was like, you know, I think this is very typical for high schoolers where it's like building a resume. It's like, if I want to get into a good college, I have to have this long list of things that I'm really good at. But being a generalist isn't very satisfying because everyone has their passion, the thing that they actually care about doing. Mm and not having time to do that and not having trust from the adults. Um, that I think is the fundamental difference between the way I grew up and the way that people in alternative education grow up is that the dominant message I got every day was you're only doing a good job if you're satisfying the adults. And there wasn't any messaging that was like, you know what you should be studying, you know who you are, you know what you should be doing with your time, don't waste your time on things that aren't important to you. That message wasn't ever there. Hmm. And, and how did you, how was your relationship to your, uh, to your parents? Uh, I mean, did you talk about your edu education? What was, did you have any pressure from home? Not really. Um, my mother was a former high school English teacher, so, <laughs> She and I clashed a lot around kind of this, um, like it needing to be perfect all the time. Jewish mother, right? <laughs> so my father, I think, was very um, respectful of, of whatever I wanted to do. Um, so I guess, you know, opposites attract. I had one of each type in my life growing up. But as an adult, my parents have been very supportive of the things that I've gotten into, and it hasn't been a particularly traditional uh, career path for me. So right. founding the school was interesting because the before we founded the school, we spent three years kind of fundraising and building a community of support and trying to get parents who would really commit to being people in the first year of the school, which for most parents is terrifying because you have nothing to show them. Right. You know, you're, you're selling them a, an idea that hasn't been realized yet. And so in those three years, I spent a lot of my time basically arguing the case about why this education was important. And my mother was probably the hardest person to convince. And in a way it kind of, like, I think I've, I've won her over now. Um, but it was a really fruitful exercise to be in dialogue with her about like, you know, why is this the educational model that I believe in? Because I think in some respects, parents are challenged if you say to them, what you gave me wasn't the best thing possible. 
because it it triggers a very deep emotional reaction for parents of like guilt and shame and like oh I didn't I didn't do right by my child I didn't give them the best thing or the thing that they wanted and it's like well it's not really about that that's you know that's what it is it's fine but what do we want for our children you know what do we want for the next generation how can we learn from what we've gone through and come out and create something better and like <laughs> i talk to a lot of parents who will say something like well i did it and i turned out fine and it's like yeah but most people don't even recognize the amount of educational trauma that they've endured and that they still hold on to without any awareness of it like a lot of people carry that educational trauma into their relationships and into their work environments where the same problems that they encountered in high school or even middle school or now we see it in elementary school and kindergarten where it's like you're not good enough you're never good enough like it's always about being better than you already are so a lot of people carry those wounds not realizing where they came from it came from their schooling hmm I've never heard that term before, educational trauma. Right. It's kind of like people have never heard of this idea of children's rights. <laughs> like children are not thought of as human beings until they're 18 years old, right? Until we give them legal status, children are like this incredibly oppressed class with no rights. And educational trauma is part of a group of ideas that are completely obfuscated by the adult culture. Because I think a lot of adults don't take children very seriously. It's like, you know... Most people are still working out the shit from their childhood that is unresolved. And then for adults to look at children and minimize their experience and to say like, oh, they'll get over it or they're just going through a phase. It's like, no, they're going through like suffering that we're not addressing. And then this is going to play out later in life. And you're not okay just because you came out and you're semi-functional. If you're not capable of happiness, or like forming healthy relationships. Who cares if you can get straight A's? I mean, getting straight A's isn't even a job. <laughs> mm, right. So I'm, 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 I just want to get back to the idea of the school because I think maybe it would be uh, nice to present how, how, what the idea looks like, but also uh, uh, how, how, come you, how come you had the idea in the first place? Right. Where did the idea come from? So it kind of started with this intuition that I wanted to do work with kids. Uh, I had been coaching an ultimate Frisbee team, actually. It's kind of like a little side gig. And oh. I just really enjoyed working with these young people. Uh, so first I was like, well, maybe I'll be a public school teacher. And I went and like um, was kind of uh, auditing the experience of being in a classroom. Like I came in for a half day. And it felt awful lot like I imagine prison feels um, most of what was going on was classroom management, not learning. Like most of the, the airtime in, in the room was about, you know, hey, you sit down. Hey, you stop doing that. Hey, you stop or I'm going to put you in, you know, the de detention or I'm going to send you the principal's office. All this threat, all this coercion. And I was like, I really don't like it here. I'm just going to, you know, check this off the list. So then I looked into what is known as progressive education and I substitute taught at a few progressive schools and... Like Montessori or Wal Waldorf? Uh, no, so it's not necessarily a different model of education as much as a slightly different pedagogical approach. Right. But my point about the, the progressive schools is that they're very similar to traditional schools, except for that the class sizes are smaller. Um, the teachers go by their first names. Mm. There's a more gentle approach. There's a lot less bullying. Part of this is because these schools cost like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. So, you know, you're paying for a more safe emotional environment for your child. But at the same time, after kindergarten, it becomes very teacher centered all of a sudden. It's actually interesting in the history of the United States in the 1920s, there was this progressive movement and there were these thinkers who said schools should be like life because that makes sense. Right? Children want to learn how to be adults, so why don't we create a, a model of adulthood that is just for them that they can play and experiment in. Hmm. But then during the Red Scare, those ideas were associated with communism, and so progressive had like a sharp left turn, and it became very traditional all of a sudden. All right. So the legacy of that progressive idea really got lost in translation during the 50s. Hmm. So... I liked my time in progressive schools, but I really felt like there was something a little bit better. And uh, actually the wife of one of the uh, 
dad's, okay, one of the parents of someone I coached Ultimate Frisbee of gave me this book about this school, Sudbury Valley. And Sudbury Valley hilariously was like, three miles from where I grew up, like the town next door. I never heard of it, I'd never known about it. It was founded in, I think, 1963. And I spent a week there kind of just auditing it and seeing, you know, how does this work? What does it look like? Um, the school is known as a free democratic school. So the free part means that there's no teachers, no tests, no classes, no curriculum. Everyone's completely free to do what they want with their body, with their time, with their learning, even if that means taking a nap all day, even if that means playing video games all day, whatever it is. Like as long as you're not violating the rules and under some sort of punishment, you have freedom to do what you wanna do. Mm. The other piece of it is the democracy side, which is that all the adults and all the kids have one vote each and every decision is made democratically. So hiring and firing the staff, allocating the budget, administering justice, making the rules, the kids have a say in every aspect of the school's organization. So I spent some time here and the thing that really turned me on it, not only seeing that the kids were you know, happy and confident and knew who they were, but then I was having a conversation with one of the staff people and I said, you know, did you guys ever do any studies on this? And he pulls out this book and they've got 30 years of data from their graduates and they ask them 10 questions every year for 30 years. And one of the questions was, or the last question was, are you happy with the life that you have? And 99% said yes. And, you know, one of the things was that the college attendance rate was 11 points higher than the public education system those who wanted to go to college, it was actually 99% of kids that wanted to go to college went to college. But it was that thing about making a life that you enjoy that really sold me on the idea. Because it's like, this is not a one size fits all approach to education. You know, if someone's going to be passionate as an artist or a neuroscientist or a janitor or someone that just like, follows the Grateful Dead around the country and like that's their thing. Like yeah. whatever it is that you're passionate about should be what drives you towards the life you're living. And almost everything else is a distraction from that passion. Like the, the idea that, that childhood is about becoming an adult puts this kind of fallacious boundary between children and adults that it's like, you're not real people yet you'll know what real life is like when you're older and then you'll figure yourself out. There's this whole thing about going to college and finding yourself. It's like, that's crazy. What, where have you been for the last 18 years? You know, mm. How have you only begun to find yourself now that you're basically an adult? Right. So that really turned it for me. And then I came back to Los Angeles and I uh, looked online to see if there were any schools like this. There weren't, but there was a woman in Orange County who was putting together one of these schools. So I linked up with her and we, along with three other people became this founders group and we started the school. And when was that? Oh, well, that was five years ago. So I think 2015. 2015, yeah. right. So I'm really curious also about the, um, the method of, 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 or basically the idea to, to let the kids choose themselves, not only choose within the system, but also choose the system. Right. So uh, that's what I hear was the difference between what you guys are doing now and that uh, progressive school with a more tender approach, but it was still within the frame of like a traditional school. Right. Well, I mean, there's this incredible heaviness to adult privilege that is, again, an unexamined bias. Like when kids come to our school after having been in a traditional school for a while, they usually gravitate towards the adults for the first few weeks because everything that they've ever known has been, I'm taking my cues from the adult. Yeah. Like I need to know what to do next. Yeah. And then they start to realize that the adults aren't there to entertain them or educate them or to like fix their problems or to create a world for them. It's like, no, you're responsible for your life. If at the end of this experience, you know, you just did what everyone else told you to do, you wouldn't arrive at the only thing that I can basically tell parents. You know, I, I can't guarantee that your kid's gonna know trigonometry. I can't guarantee that they're gonna know European history. I can't guarantee that they're you know, going to ever play sports or do art or whatever, but I can guarantee you that at the end of this process, they're gonna know who they are. You know what that reminds me of? Uh, people going to Burning Man for the first time. 
Mm. Like looking for the organizers. Right. Should, How do I do this? What should I do now? Where do I find what? <laughs> right. And 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 they they look like question marks. Right. Looking for for uh, somebody else to to give them the answer. Right. And after a couple of days, you, you watch people unfold. Right. That's beautiful. I, I imagine it's almost like the same process. Yeah. I mean, I think generally with the school, there's this is maybe not like Burning Man, but like they show <laughs> up and they're like full on like. I get to do whatever I want. Oh, I'm going to like play this video game all day, every yeah. day. And the parents kind of grimace and they're like, oh, I don't like this. They're just going to play video games all the time. And then six months later, they finish the video game and they're like, oh. Now what? Now what? Hmm. And then there's what I like to call the wall of boredom. And we have this kind of cultural idea that we need to rescue children from their boredom. Like, oh no, my child is bored. Like I need to fill their time with activities because yeah. boredom is a waste of time. And like, you know, any good scientist or philosopher or whatever I think of Einstein or like Isaac Newton chilling under the tree. It's like, you need to be bored for the apple to fall and then the realization is right in front of you. Like life presents itself in a phenomenological way. The moment arises and it, it presents itself, but not because you forced it to happen, because you actually were in repose. You were taking a step back from it and instead of pursuing it and being kind of thirsty about like, well, what's the best thing to be doing right now? It's like, the best thing sometimes is to be doing nothing. So I, I have a 10 year old, uh, I have a daughter and whenever she comes to me uh, and tells me that dad, I'm bored, my answer is always congratulations. What a luxury. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks at me, you know, she, she hates that answer, but she knows that's what, she's, what she gets. Right. And then she, she goes away for a while, then she comes back. Like the first 10, 15 minutes, I think she, she goes back and forth maybe three, five times, and then she goes away and I don't hear from her like for two hours. Right. And then I go to her room and uh, she's either been painting or uh, creating like, an, like, a, uh, like a sculpture or uh, uh, like playing the piano or something like that. Right. And she so, becomes self-directed. Yeah. She doesn't need you to tell you what, but the what ten, she should do. The first 10, 15 minutes, it's like, uh, it's like testing my parenthood. Right. And I need to resist the urge to give her right. the answer. And kids do this all the time. Kids are really incredibly intelligent at manipulating the adults into solving their problems for them. Like there's this one kid at school who she's always trying to get me to open her juice box, <laughs> even though I know that she knows that she can do it. Right. It's common knowledge, but wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to do this? And maybe if I like, you know, cry or yeah. make a big deal out of it, then he'll cave and he'll just do it. And it's actually funny because she, she recently revealed to me the, the falsity of her crying. She's like, oh, like this works on my dad all the time. Yeah. Like if I just cry and then if he doesn't give it to me, I up the ante to tantrum and that's usually when he caves. And I'm like, well, now that you've told me this, you know, I'm never going to cave, right? But I, I bet she trusts you more. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, because that, I, I, I think that what, what's happening there is that they're trying out to see where the boundary is right and if there's no boundary i think they basically feel unsafe right and they'll hate you for it later right uh, but at the moment they, it's, it's like throwing a ball and to see where the ball is right and if they just throw balls and the balls all disappear right it's going to create some kind of existential or psychological unsafety right uh, and that creates an anxiety but right. i and 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 i i i I have a lot of friends who are like progressive in their parenthood and and and, and sometimes they mix up uh, progressive or, or or free with limitless. Right. And that's not the same thing for me. No. So I I, I, I Well that's I, where the democracy comes in because the community has to establish a framework of rules that yeah. define the limits. Right. But the the important thing is that it's not imposed upon them by an adult who says, I know what the limits should be. It's saying it's our collective responsibility to understand the limits that are yes. appropriate for this community in this moment. And those limits might change in the future. Mm. But for right now we have to all be operating within a comprehensive system. Right. Right. So it's, 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 it's the same thing uh, that we talked about before. Like we need to know where the game starts, ends and what the rules are. Right. Well, I think the thing that it always boils down to me, like I've gotten very good at understanding how to push parents directly into the cognitive dissonance of like, are you really serious about going to this school, like putting your kids in this school? And I kind of learned about this from this 
educational philosopher named Jiddu Krishnamurti, who is amazing. Um, <laughs> I spent some time at the Krishnamurti Foundation in Ojai, and it was a very interesting course. But basically, Krishnamurti will say things like, you know, parents obviously don't love their children if they allow them to go into a system that turns them into weapons of the state or industrial cogs in the machine. You know, mm. this is not what love actually means. So generally, when I talk to parents, I'll just say, do you love your child enough to be completely okay with them being whoever they choose to be, even if that is not the person you want them to be? And that's really where the fundamental challenge, I think, of parenting is, that parents tend to have certain desires for their, their children to be in alignment with them somehow, you know, that they want to feel connected to them on, a, on an intellectual or ideological level. So if children decide to have different political opinions or different philosophical opinions about reality, parents can feel very alienated. And the kind of the primal urge is like to coerce it, to be like, no, let me teach you what's right and wrong because I'm the adult and I know, and you're my child. Yeah. Instead of saying, well, what do you think right and wrong means? That's where it gets really, really hard for people, you know? There's this one, um, one of the things I do is I work with staff. So I, I train staff and there is this staff member and she came to me once and she was like really bothered because the, the kids, one of the things the kids do is they wanna make money. So they start businesses and there's this snack bar corporation that funds an exploration and adventure corporation and they go on camping trips and all this stuff. Anyway, they sell candy and soda because mm. that's what kids wanna buy, mm. right? So this staff person was like, I don't like that our culture has so much sugar in it. Like sugar, you know, according to her, she's like, sugar is worse than heroin. Sugar is the worst. It's the most addictive substance. We shouldn't have it in the school. And I said, well, what are you gonna do? Like, how are you going to bring this into the community? And she said, well, I don't know. Can you help me like manipulate the, the judicial process, you know, the, the legislative process to, to figure out how we can make this work? Cause it's important. I said, well, no, we can't do that. But I guess the first thing you could try to do is um, just start gardening here and selling healthy snacks and you know, it's free market. So mm -hmm. maybe people buy it, maybe yeah. they don't, you can't force them to, but having it available might, might help. And the other thing you could do is try to convince everyone that your opinion is valid, that, yeah. you know, what you're saying is true and that we should ban sugar from the campus. And she said, well, I tried both of those things and they didn't work. I said, okay, let's take a different approach here. So she's got a four-year-old daughter. And I said, all right, thought experiment. Your four-year-old, we're 20 years down the line. She's been at this school the whole time. She's 300 pounds. She's diabetic. Can you still love that person? Like, can you accept her even if she embodies the thing that you're most afraid of? Can you find it to, you know, let your love be limitless and unconditional? And she kind of was like, well, I guess I have to find a way to do that. Cause that's really where it comes down to. Like, obviously most kids aren't going to have a problem regulating when they have natural consequence, you know, natural consequence experiences. Like most kids learn not to eat too much candy because they eat too much candy and then they get sick and they puke, mm. you know? That's how it works. That's how most adults learn to do mm. these kind of things. Mm. But restricting it, this is the same argument about alcohol, right? That like in Europe, there's a lot less problems with this because there's a more controlled introduction of alcohol into the lives of young people than in the United States where people haven't had a drink until they go to college and then on the first night of college they get absolutely wasted because they have no context mm. so you know it, it all boils down to this question about what does unconditional love mean i think this is an interesting question for me because like love is this really common idea we hear this word constantly all the time and perhaps it's been commodified in some way but i think even when people have a pretty like what they perceive to be a pure understanding of love this concept of being unconditional in our love is so challenging you see this in the polarization of the electorate in this country right like I've seen since the election with uh, 2016, people have broken up with their families because they're like, I can't love you if you voted for the president. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I totally get that it's hard. Loving people isn't easy. Loving people is fundamentally challenging because we have to put aside ourselves and say like, I'm here to welcome and give hospitality to whoever you are. and that's 
like the challenge of life, right? That's what like most religions are talking about, right? Like how do we get there? It's like a superhuman ability. How do we learn how to love unconditionally? Yeah. And then with forest therapy, a big part of my job is how do we learn how to extend that love to the earth? You know, that we don't know how to love the earth either. I, I mean, I mean, when, when you talk about like, so you just, you, 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 you took another perspective of this and I, and I love the whole like, philosophical discussion about love because I, I i agree with you it has to do with both parenting um but also polarization because some especially in in, in the podcast we've been doing in sweden so for two years we did uh, a swedish version of this podcast uh, and i invited you know all kinds of people i, I invited priests uh, imams and sex workers uh, ex-nazis people on the left on the right and we we'd had a lot of critique on who who we'd invited but the whole premise of the podcast is to invite all parts of the spectrum and all like pieces of the puzzle and to me love is not uh, agreeing with every piece of the puzzle love for me is to you know be able to to see it as a whole right and to be to be able to see like uh, uh, society or, or or the world world as a whole also creates like this mirror image inside of me right so it's it's like a, this inner and outer perspective and and uh, by talking to someone that i don't agree with and loving that person helps me to connect with that part in myself and that helps me to connect with that person right um well it's like we can't arrive at love through an intellectual process which is like, if we're talking about our ideas, we're having an abstract conversation. It's not about love. Like, we're just having discourse. Yeah. Right? And discourse and love are not the same thing. I think this is one of the reasons why you see people at Burning Man being very loving, because they're completely detached from the ego. You know, one of the things about Burning Man that I thought was funny was a lot of times you run into these strangers and you hear the same thing over and over again. They're like, oh, this is a place where I can really be myself. Mm. And my response to them is always, no, this is a place where you don't have to be anyone. <laughs> like you are completely detached from the ego, from the self. And when you do that, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong or if you're on the left or the right, like those kind of intellectual classifications fall away because it's like within this liminal space of burning man we're all just kind of human beings yeah right but, but i think i think they're actually right i think it's maybe they're trying to say something else because um i think you both are saying the same thing maybe because what you're what, what i'm hearing you saying is that you don't need to be like this human character right and they're saying i don't i i, I can be myself and I think they mean the greater, like the bigger self. Sure. That, that, that's like manifested through us all. Sure, yes. So that's like the self they're talking about and sure. not the character, not the persona. Right. Yes, um, the mask comes off. Yeah, the mask comes off and that's, that, that feels like myself because it's actually like the greater self or like the, um, the non-egoic self. Yeah, I mean, I think of that level of self as being fairly non-personal though. Yes. It's like when we take away all of the labels mm. upon ourselves, it's like, I'm this gender, I'm this race, I do this job, I have this education, I have these relationships, whatever, and you kind of strip that all back, then really we're just kind of like points of attention. We're just here in this moment and our bodies are like these incredible data processing machines that you know, through our senses, we understand the world around us and it's coming at us at a blindingly fast pace. And the brain is so capable of processing almost all of that data subconsciously that we're never really paying attention because we're never really here. Yeah. And that, that thing about presence is like, when you're in Burning Man, there's nothing that you have to do. There's no like, I have to go pay my bills or I have to like get this done or whatever. It's like this grand adventure, you know? And it's like, no one asks you what you do for a living. Right. I love that. Right. No one asks you like how you drove here or yeah, like it's very oriented around this moment in time as opposed to what exists outside of that boundary. Mm. I, was, uh, I was about to ask you something, but I forgot it. 
So, um, I bet there's a lot of triggers in. I'm assuming that there's a lot of triggers in what you guys are doing with the school, because education is is a subject where people have a lot of opinions, right? Yes. So I'm just I'm just thinking. Right, I, w- I was about to tell you something about my dad. That was it. So when I grew up, uh, my dad used to tell me not to, uh, not to think too much or not to read uh, uh, particular books, mm. because he he came from this intellectual background as a as a as a political activist from his home country, and where some books were considered dangerous. Mm-hmm. So he always told me not to be too philosophical, not to read too much, or I got, I, I would get stuck in my brain, uh, and I would get de- depressed or, or suicidal. I think he, he told me this when I was maybe ten, and I remember every time he told me not to read a book, I would go read that book. <laughs> <laughs> so like the first memory I have of my dad s- telling me not to read a book was uh, was. Uh, I think it was Kafka, mm. uh, and I think it was the I don't know what, what the English title of the book is, but it's it, it's about this guy who wakes up and he's transformed into a bug. Yes, I know which story you're talking about. It's not the process. It's it's uh, yeah, uh, and he told me like the premise of the book, and said that you shouldn't read this book because your cousin. Uh, read this book and after he read it he tried to kill himself mm. and I was like that sounds really exciting I need to read that book and sure. I I read that book and I loved it and I read all of Kafka's book books as, as a 10, 11 year old <laughs> which f- probably f- formed me a lot so it's it's like you said before that if you if you if you resist something or if you prohibit something it's going to create even more attraction or attention to that subject. Right. Every law creates an outlaw. Yeah. Uh, and well, in, 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 but I mean, in this particular situation, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he did because I, I'm really happy I, I read Kafka. But, but in other situations, that created a lot, a lot of tension between me and my parents because they, they wanted me to, to, to seek out a particular profession and I wanted to be a writer and that created a lot of uh, tension and, and, and distance between us. But as I grew older and I became a parent myself, I realized that that's just misdirected love. Yeah. Because they, they, they left their home country. We went to Sweden when I was two years old. They were, you know, they felt insecure. They didn't know how this new society works and they just wanted the best for me. Yep. But that misdirected love created some, some, some kind of tension and distance between us. But as I grew older and as I became a dad, I realized that this is just, they cared about me. They wanted yes. the best for me. Uh, but I also learned from that experience. Uh, so what I've recognized now later on is that maybe my dad was afraid uh, of getting stuck in his thoughts, but I'm not. So he was actually telling me what he was afraid of. Right. And 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 that gave and he was me, projecting himself. On he was you. projecting, but but that experience taught me, uh, and also, I mean, inspires me to not project on my daughter. Right. And I know projection from my dad you know, projecting on me. So that was actually a lesson. Right. right? Well, it's all a lesson. <laughs> like no matter what you do, uh, I don't think there's any way to, to work with children or to work with humans and avoid some sort of, you know, misstep or, you know, we all have wounds from our emotional development as young people. It's just part of it. And it doesn't mean we can't also try to do things differently. Right. So I'm curious about your other, uh, I, I don't want to say project, but, but your other uh, area of expertise. So uh, n- maybe not everyone knows what forest bathing is. So just give us an introduction to it. Right. Well, it's kind of a complicated story at this point, but uh, the, the short version is that in the 1980s, 
Uh, the Japanese were going through a shift in their economy where people were going from outdoor jobs to mostly indoor jobs with the tech boom, right? So the government noticed this huge spike in cancer and autoimmune disease, and they started doing some research projects about how can we combat this health threat. And one of the projects asked a very simple question, which was just what are the physiological impacts of exposing human bodies to a forest environment? And one thing that they discovered is that trees keep themselves healthy by showering themselves in these phytochemicals called phytoncides. Phyton meaning plant, side meaning killer. So phytoncides are antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal chemicals. So let's say a fungus is attacking the tree. The tree diffuses these chemicals into the air and they find the fungus and they kill it, thus preserving the tree, right? Oh, so it's right. like the tree's immune system. Hmm. The mind blowing thing is that because all of our ancestors evolved under trees, when we inhale phytoncides, it triggers the production of a special kind of white blood cell called a natural killer cell or an NK cell. And NK cells are part of your innate immune system System, which means they're not looking for specific diseases, they're looking for stressed cellular growth in your body. So stressed cells have the risk of becoming cancer cells. Right. So what NK cells do is they preemptively terminate cells that are stressed so they don't turn into cancer. Wow. So the Japanese said, wow, this is amazing, you know, we need to get people out into the forest. And they started developing this framework of practice that they called Shinjin Yoku. Shinjin meaning forest, Yoku meaning bath, so forest bathing. And the idea is it's kind of a double entente that you're bathing in these phytochemicals of the forest. You know, if you imagine the atmosphere like an ocean, it's like you're bathing in these chemicals, but you're also bathing in your senses. So like the, the English phrase sunbathing is like, you're just laying in the sun, right? You're, you're enjoying the sensations, the heat and the light and you know, the sound of the waves. You're, you're having the sensory experience of the ocean or the beach. And so the Japanese practice of Shinin Yoku really focuses on helping people get in touch with their senses. Hmm. Now, the organization that I work for is called the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy. And we kind of piggyback on that scientific approach, but also extend it in a slightly different direction. So whereas a lot of the initial uh, scientific research on forest bathing was about the health impacts that humans can receive from nature, we kind of take a, a maybe opposite approach of saying, how do we cultivate reciprocal relationships between humans and nature? So it's not an extractive wellness process. It's not looking at nature like a resource and saying, well, how do we just get our health from it? You know, how do we turn this into a medical resource? So instead saying, well, look, you know, just being outside is giving you a lot of these health benefits. Like that's not something that is that hard to accomplish. The really challenging thing is actually an ecological crisis that we're having. Uh, I think personally that the reason we've got here is because we've over-intellectualized and thus abstracted ourselves from nature. And this is something that's probably been going on since Descartes, you know, that Descartes had this idea that nature was like a machine and that human beings are like this very special creature. They're not like nature, they're, you know, conscious, whereas everything else is just basically a resource and that trees don't have thoughts or feelings or spirit, right? They're just things. So if we look at the world like that, it's impossible to have an authentic and reciprocal relationship with something that is just a thing, mm. right? So how do we shift people's perception towards a more kind of kin-centric approach, thinking about how do we find our relatedness? Kin-centric? Kin-centric, yeah, kin like family. All right, okay. Yeah. So there's kind of this huge evolving practice around the world um, and I think forest therapy, forest bathing is actually kind of part of a, an even wider cultural movement about what you could call nature connection or nature relation. Uh, and that, you know, people are waking up to the fact that it's not about how much you know about nature. That doesn't actually solve things. Like we've known about climate change, global warming, ocean acidification, you know, species extinction. We know about all these things and we have a lot of data and you can look at the graphs and the charts and the numbers and people are still apathetic. 
They don't have a heart-centered approach. They don't feel it. They know it, but they don't feel it. And I think part of the interesting thing here is kind of shifting from a more intellectual approach to a more heart-centered approach. Right. I was reading this book recently and the author was talking about the etymology of the word pathetic. Um, Cause you know, the modern uh, definition of this word is like something inferior um, or, you know, kind of disgusting or whatever. It's, it's not good, it's pathetic. And that an older definition of the word relates it to pathos and like the stirring of emotion and passion and inspiration and feelings like sorrow and grief and, and beauty and excitement and awe and wonder. And that these are the things that make us feel alive and make us feel connected to things. So we've developed an apathetic culture by privileging the mind over the heart, that the heart has its own intelligence or its own wisdom, but we've had a like a cultural war against the intelligence of the heart since Descartes, perhaps, maybe even earlier. But scientism, the idea that science is the only thing that gets to define reality has minimized the wisdom of the heart to such an extent that people are numb. We have this culture of anesthesia where people don't actually feel very much of anything. Part of that is because technology, we've outsourced a lot of our sensing to technology. You know, When we were hunters and gatherers or farmers, you needed your body and your senses to be very awake. But now, we don't really need to use our bodies as much as we used to. And so we've become numb and that's created this apathy, which is the opposite of the pathetic heart, is the apathetic heart. And that we don't have an emotional connection to nature. So we don't feel when you know things are going wrong. It's clear to the mind that things are going wrong, but why doesn't the behavior change? Hmm. Right, and, and I mean, just the word nature creates like a distance. It's humanity. We don't and even use nature. that word. We <laughs> use the phrase the more than human world, yeah. which in some ways is a challenging phrase also because some people will say, you know, that implies that it's like humans are underneath and nature is on top. And really it's like this circle where everything is included. Like humans are nature, nature's are human, whatever. Yeah. It's all the same thing. It's all this material world. We're all connected, we're all related. So it's, it's not even a useful binary. Like yeah. thinking about nature and humans is, is unuseful in some ways in the same way that talking about humans and the more than human world is unuseful. And I think it's, it goes even deeper and, and earlier than Descartes. I think maybe Descartes just put, he put words to it, but, but I think it goes even further back. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not even gonna try to explain or have like an idea of where it started. But I agree with you and I can see that tendency of, of both the apathy, but also like the separation, the sense of not belonging right. uh, to this, you know, this whole thing. Right. Uh, both uh, like s spiritually, but also uh, with, with uh, the more than human world as right. you express it. I, I can just, I could, I could go to myself. I was brought up in a very, you know, urban environment, uh, in high rise. I've been this, I've been like a city kid all my life. And, uh, when I grew up, uh, maybe I, like subconsciously I've been, uh, having partners and I've been dating girls and women who have a very soft and very, like very strong connection to nature. Mm. And they invited me and helped me to to also like reconnect that part of myself, uh, and and also you know going to Burns, uh, going to these you know uh, places where I need to confront like the what what I what I what I perceive as the hostility of nature because I have a very chaotic and hostile version of nature. I I, I need to. I need to work on that relationship, <laughs> and I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, automatically uh, feel the urge to to go to a forest or go to go to like a more natural place. I, I, I feel more safe in the city, but that's something that I work on, and I, I, I realize that there's something, there's a disconnection there, and I, I, I know I'm not alone. Right. I mean, it's interesting that we even have a dichotomy about nature and not nature because like you and I are sitting at a table made of wood mm. with this glass that has water in it. Yeah. And like this whole house was built out of the earth. Our cell phones were built out of the earth. This microphone was built out of the earth. Like yeah. every single thing is 
part of this. Yeah. Like it's all transforming constantly, but it's not like there's nature out there and in the city there's no nature. I mean, in LA, it's very obvious, right? We've got trees and animals and sky and water and waves and mountains and all these things. It's like, but it's fascinating the kind of um, like blindness that people can have when they're in the city. It's like, there's no nature here. We're just in the city. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. It's all here. I'm not even sure if the divide is between nature and city. I think it's about, I think there's something to, to explore about what you said before, about looking at other, looking at others. And when I say others, I mean like others, right. other nodes, looking at them as souls or things. Right. I think that's the main divide because I mean, if we treated um, houses and, and streets uh, more soulfully, right. I think that's, a, uh, that's uh, getting close to the main issue. Right. So this is one of the reasons why the Japanese yeah. kind of get away with having exactly. a hyper-medical approach. Because mm. like in Japan, the legacy of Shinto and Zen Buddhism has infused the culture with a very deep and fundamental nature connection. Yeah. So like one of the things you'll see in Japan is they have these very old trees that are basically these spirits, they call them kami. And you have these bells, these enormous bells. And when you approach the tree, you ring the bell and that wakes up the kami, but it also wakes up you. And so it forges relationship. It becomes a process where we are being, it's not that we're looking at the tree and it's a one way street. It's that we're waking the tree up. So it is looking at us and yes. we are looking at it. And now we're having reciprocity. Now there's a two way exchange. So. I, I was at this conference in Finland and there was this um, guy, uh, Dr. Iwao Uihara, and he was really wonderful and brilliant. And he was talking about these bells. And I was asking him like, can we export this idea to the rest of the world? Like, how do you bring this kind of thing? And he said, you know, all cultures have this very deep in the past. Like, it's not about your cultural tradition. It's about the legacy of, of being here as a part of this community of living things. Mm. So I always talk about my work in forest therapy as not being about teaching. It's about the facilitation of remembering or returning. This thing about turning back in horizontal time and vertical time perhaps as well, that it necessitates a turning back to a more ancient time when we were connected to the earth, when we had to experience ontologies besides humans as having spirit because our existence was bound to them in a way that we relied on plants and animals and water and sun. And these things were relationships that were fundamental to our existence. So it's all it's like embedded in our DNA, you know, we all are born into this somehow. And, you know, you, you're a parent. So when you have a baby, the baby isn't thinking about the meaning of life. The baby is focusing on the process of being alive, which is another way of saying, exploring with our senses, that we're not trying to label things and say, I know what that is, it's a rose, saying, I wonder what that smells like or tastes like or feels like, and watching it exist as a being unto itself, the way it, it blossoms and then, and then decays. Like there's this whole association that comes to us from our relationships with nature that isn't about knowing it. It's not about naming it and saying like, I already know what you are. It's kind of interesting because I, I talk about, there's this analogy where I say, if you're in relationship with someone like your child or your partner or your parent or whoever, your friend, the pleasure of the relationship is in the constant surprise of never fully knowing them because they don't stay the same forever. You know. As humans, we are always changing and part of the pleasure of being in a relationship is that it evolves, it progresses, it's an infinite game, right? It never stops. Right. But when we name things like we do with nature, where it's like, this is what this species of tree is called and these are the kinds of seeds it drops and these are the things that we can get as medicine from it, then it reduces it to just one of a million other things that has no individual quality to it. It's kind of like, you know, the prerequisite for genocide is often that one group convinces the, the wider culture that a certain group are not human. Yeah. They're just animals. 
right? Yeah. They don't have individual like soul. Um, they're just like nothingness, you know, they, they have no individual value at all. Right. And so when we think about trees, like they're all just maple trees or they're all just pine yeah. trees, we're effectively doing the same thing, which makes it easy for us to clear cut the forest. Instead of saying, you know, what is the species name of this tree? Well, what is this particular tree's name? Does right. this tree have something about it that no other member of its species shares? Like what is the, the personal quality? And then when these beings kind of have that integrity that, you know, we've been, withholding from them, then it's really hard to enact violence upon the world because now you're in a relationship. You've granted you know, a, a certain integrity or a personhood to things beyond yourself. And then it becomes hard to abuse them. Right. Jacques Cousteau talked about, we only protect what we love. Yeah. So it's not about understanding the world. It's not about unraveling the secrets of the universe. Blaise Pascal in response to Descartes, I think, therefore I am. He said, the heart has reason which the mind cannot know. It's like we feel things and those feelings are as legitimate as our cognitive process, but we've obfuscated and minimized it so much that now we need to relearn or remember how to do these kinds of things. And remember is one of my favorite words because there's this like folk etymology and true etymology. So the true etymology of remember, re to do again, and then member comes uh, from the English word for memory. So it's about putting a scene back in your mind. You know, you're reconstructing something in your mind, remember. But then the folk etymology, remember is the opposite of dismember. Right. And so we're also putting our bodies back together because we've forgotten that we are bodies first and foremost. We're not minds who control a body. The body is first. Mm. The mind is reacting to the body and it's all unified, right? That's what I, 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 I realized. I mean, I learned a lot from the, the whole burner community and also uh, on, on, on retreats or when I go meditating uh, is how to use rituals. Mm. So rituals have become a very important part of my life the last 10 years because that's the embodiment. Right. It's, it's reconnecting with, with uh, something greater than myself, but through the body. Right. So, so like, for example, I've been, I've been, I've been doing this morning ritual the last couple of years. Now, every morning when I wake up, it's like my body knows what to do. I don't even think about it. I right. could be half asleep right. and I just go up to my yoga mat and I do my morning ritual. Right. And I think that we, we, and we have a lot of like unconscious rituals as mm -hmm. well. Like, you know, uh, everything from, from working or, or uh, you know, going on social media, overeating, these are also rituals. Like m these unconscious mechanical rituals that create a, 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 another kind of embodiment, maybe with with ideas or connections we don't want to. So I'm, I'm. What I'm thinking is that the, the the whole aspect of of forest bathing, like the the medical part aside, it's also a ritual. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it it has a ritual framework to it where we kind of we don't talk about this intellectually, but we are creating a threshold where people move or shift their attention from their cognitive process to their sensing embodied process. That's like coming back to our jazz thing about how do we start, how do we play, how do we end? So getting people into their bodies is really the first step. Actually, I should say getting them into their bodies and getting them to slow down is the first step. And then in the middle, there's kind of this dynamic play where we say the forest is the therapist, the guide just opens the doors. So we're not there to prescribe what the relationship should look like. It's basically like, if I get you into your body, your body knows what to do. It knows if it wants to be on the rock or if it wants to be under the tree. It knows whether it wants to take your shoes off and go in the creek or if you wanna lay on your back and watch the trees. It knows what it wants to do. So we don't have to coerce any outcome there. And then there's a threshold of incorporation where we, uh, we forage some plants from the forest and we make a tea. And the tea sits at the center of the circle and uh, we'll, we'll say you know, verbally what we're taking away from this 
And that all you could imagine, that wisdom goes into the teapot so that as we drink the tea, we're literally incorporating, you know, incorporating comes from in corpus, so taking into the body, the forest, but also taking in the wisdom that has come to the group through the process of the session. Hmm. So it does have a kind of a ritual structure to it, but it's, um, it's less like mindfulness and more like bodyfulness. Yeah, and when I say ritual, I don't necessarily mean holy. Oh, of course. Yeah, so yeah. Rit- ritual is just embodiment. It doesn't well, I think need to ritual, be heightened. Ritual is like shifting out of one mode of perception yeah. into a more open, curious mode of perception. Like when you were talking about like binge eating, for example, I don't know if that can be ritual because it's such an unconscious process where we're not listening to our bodies and we're, we're numb to the response of the body or else we wouldn't overeat. So we're still kind of in this default or tamed worldview where it's about a culture of anesthesia and yeah. about the kind of the the chasing of pleasure or the chasing of meaning. I was telling you about my favorite Joseph Campbell quote about people aren't looking for the meaning of life. They're looking for the experience of being alive. Mm. That's what I think forest therapy is fundamentally about for me. And part of that is about freedom that we don't feel alive when we feel constrained by rules. And so a ritual space is importantly defined as a space where the rules of you know, the, the tamed world or the default world are suspended temporarily, where you don't have to be yourself and you don't have to operate under the same kind of fundamental rules that exist in daily life. Mm. That's what I think, you know, that's the fundamental quality that we're all looking for. And maybe this comes back to our question about education is that, we yearn to be free, you know, we don't want to be tamed. <laughs> and so we find outlets for that expression. So mm. Burning Man might be one outlet for that expression of freedom and forest therapy can be thought of as, you know, kind of a different method, but similar tactic that it's not about doing it right. It's about doing it and just being in that process and seeing what comes up. There's this interesting distinction between ritual and ceremony that I was reading. Mm. I forget which author this was, some sociologist. He was talking about ceremonies are things where there's kind of a a measured conclusion. Like a wedding is a ceremony where at the end of it, two people become married. Mm. Whereas a ritual doesn't have an end point that is predetermined. It's like, who knows what's going to happen when we do this ritual? It's not a controlled process. And so therefore it has a sense of freedom to it. Right. Whereas a ceremony is really about performing rites, you know, performing the steps, doing the thing. And the thing is real because we did it a certain way. So it's finite, infinite again, right? Yes, exactly. Huh. So the forest bathing is more of an infinite ritual. Right. Because forest bathing, well, the way that the association teaches forest therapy is the health impacts are collateral. It's going to happen just from going outside. You don't need a guide to help you, you know, receive the phyton sides or get the fresh air or any of that Mm. stuff. You don't need me to do that. But what I can help you with as a guide is I can help you cultivate relationships with beings that you might have forgotten how to create those relationships. Like I was saying, I think we all know it as children. One of the things I started noticing immediately when I was doing this work was there would usually be a a man or a woman in their 50s or 60s that would start crying halfway through the walk and they would say something like, I remember when I was a child, my father said that the trees were not my friends and that it was stupid to treat them as such. And it was a waste of time and I was being silly. Mm. And so I stopped and the grief of losing those relationships, 40 years of relationship wasted, you know, the potential for connection that is lost when we push those things aside and say, it's not possible to have a relationship with a tree. What are we losing when we, we sacrifice that, you know? So, A lot of forest therapy, I think in some ways is fundamentally also grief work because when we awaken the intelligence of the heart, it instantly realizes what it's been missing. And it's almost like reconnecting with your, like a part of yourself that you were missing. Exactly. We talk about that as the phenomenon of being whole, Yeah. that there's this wholeness that humans crave. And maybe that's another way of saying the experience of being alive and that 
we have certain aspects of our own wholeness that exists within the tamed world. It's not to minimize the tamed world. It's not to say your job isn't important or your hobbies aren't important or whatever. Like all those things are part of your wholeness, but then there's this other stuff. Yeah. There's this other stuff that exists outside of the frame of the tamed world. You don't have to choose, world. it's not an either or. Exactly, well, it's not an either or, it's a both fundamentally. Yeah. Like we need to have the, the wholeness of the tamed world world and the wholeness of the wild right. and that that wild aspect is something that like you were saying it's kind of um you have this perception of nature as being kind of um like wild and uncontrollable yeah. i think that's part of it is like the wilderness is not a moral system like the tamed world is mm. i was doing this one um i sometimes i go out for a whole day and just don't talk to anyone and i just go sit in the woods or walk around and just be there. So I was doing this once and I saw a turkey mom with these eight chicks following her. And then a coyote comes along and he grabs one of the chicks and the turkey mom just takes off with the other seven chicks. And as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, does the turkey want justice? Is that part of the turkey's conscious process? Mm. Or is it kind of a fundamental acceptance that there's a reason why I have eight of these children because coyote needs to eat and we're in a relationship hmm. and this is part of that relationship. It's not about winning, right? It's not about who was right and who was wrong. And so in that way, we're connecting to a, like a very fundamental, phenomenal logical aspect of being that we are also fundamentally just animals. Right. You know, and I mean, you know, maybe Elon Musk is going to figure out how to keep us alive forever. But for the time being, we all operate on the same fundamental rules that we are born, we live, and then we die. Yeah. And that is so obfuscated by our culture, which is all about being perfect and always getting better. And you don't want to get old and you don't want to die. You want to live. And it's like, that's part of our wholeness. Our death is part of our wholeness. Our childlike curiosity is part of our wholeness. Our affection and tenderness is part of our wholeness. Our grief is part of our wholeness. Our sorrow is part of our wholeness. When we start getting in touch with the things that we're not supposed to be in touch with, then we start feeling real again. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we don't go into those ritual spaces, you begin to feel more like a robot or like you're numb and, and nothing has meaning or beauty anymore because you know, you're just doing what you're supposed to do. I mean, I would hate living forever because that's being a vampire. Mm. And you know, if you, if you watch vampires, uh, I mean, in the old Anne Rice movies or in the Twilight, they're all assholes. They all, I mean, they act like they're going to live forever. And that's not, that, that's, that takes something out of the equation, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I hope I, I, I hope to die someday. Yes, me too. I mean, <laughs> that's a part of living and that gives my life something else, I think. Right. Well, I think there's like those studies about the brain releasing like a heavy dose of DMT right before you yeah. die. Yeah. And that like, you know, you see this in texts like the Tibetan Book of the Dead and, you know, mm. ancient Egyptian mythology. And like, there's a threshold between life and death that is an important step. <laughs> like it's, uh, if you lose that, you never become whole. Yeah. So yeah, being a vampire is like being broken forever. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's, it's like you get the first part, but you don't get to finish. Right. The story just doesn't have a conclusion. Yeah. And then the, like, it's not just your story. It's that you are enmeshed in a world of other beings that we're always interacting with. Like, our, our, our whole being is relational, you know, we're never separated from the world around us. So it's, it's like when we eat plants or animals, like their death is incorporated into our life. And then we end up, you know, in the ground and then we become a mushroom colony or whatever, like your story doesn't end. It's just transforming. But I think that's where you get a lot of, um, this is again where the wisdom of the mind and the wisdom of the body become antagonistic because the mind wants to perceive itself as being abstract or being kind of like a, a disembodied 
thing, that it exists outside of the material world. And it's like, no, like your brain waves are like your heart waves, mm. you know, like it's all rooted in this body and this body is the, the center of the experience. And then that's not the end of the journey. So, so the reason uh, I, we got connected was because uh, Katrin and Sarah, two friends of mine, uh, got to know you for their book. They, doing, they were doing research for, for their book and the book is about the experience of awe. And they told me about you and I got really cur- curious. And, and I also want to connect the experience of awe with, with, with the experience of forest bathing as mm. well. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first level is that, like I was saying earlier, your brain processes most of the sensory information coming to it below the threshold of your attention because the brain is is wired for optimization mm. you know like the brain understands that it shouldn't waste your attention on things that aren't going to really matter to you so when you're walking down the street you're not really seeing the trees you're seeing something that the brain is, it's like an illusion, right? The brain is projecting a reality for you to interact with, but it's like, uh, it's pixelated, yeah. right? It's like the brain doesn't really want to give you all the details because that would be a waste of your attention. So it creates these kind of imaginary things that are good enough. Yeah, It's good enough that you're not going to run into the tree, but it's not actually seeing the tree. So the first level of awe is like, I think, so there are these, Um, trees in the forest where I do a lot of guiding. And when the leaves start to decay, they leave this kind of lattice structure. It almost looks like someone has crocheted these leaves. They're incredibly intricate. And it's amazing because someone will pick up the first one they see and just be so in awe of it. Oh my God, this is amazing. And then they look around and there's thousands of them, you know, and then they have this realization of like, oh, like I'm not ever here. Like I'm not really seeing the world and how incredible it is because most of the time my brain is thinking about work or what am I eating tonight? Or I have to plan my partner's birthday party or whatever. Like our, our brains, our minds, I should say, our minds are always taking up so much of our attention that our senses aren't really being engaged. So the first level of awe is really basic. It's just seeing the world for what it is and seeing how amazing and intricate and incredible something is. And the sensations, it's like, have you ever done mindful eating? Yeah. 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 So like, this is a thing where people can really understand that when we focus our mental attention on the senses, it amplifies the world. Like, you know, you, you cut the, like, let's say a kiwi in half and you look at it, you really look how many colors are there, the patterns of the seeds, and then you smell it and then you taste it. And there's all these layers of flavor. And you compare that to eating when you're watching TV, right? Yeah. You don't taste the same thing. It could be mm. the exact same fruit, but yeah. because we're not paying attention, there's nothing like the experience of being really present with it. So this fundamental level of awe is actually noticing the simplicity of the world, the beauty and the simplicity. And it's, it's not necessarily about seeing, uh, a soaring eagle flying through a rainbow, right? It doesn't need to be like this psychedelic, amazing thing that never happens. It can be these really simple things of just hearing the wind move through the trees and really listening and noticing all the different notes in that song, just being like, wow. And then I think there's this other piece of awe, which is more about the inner journey Like you were saying, there's like this psychological mirror sometimes where like we encounter something and it illuminates something within ourselves. And part of that I think is about bodyfulness. Like we've often forgotten that we are bodies. So when you start feeling your heartbeat or, you know, feeling the sensation of standing, just what does it feel like to be standing on the earth? I mean, these kind of things can be really incredible. We're taught to think of the body as a negative thing, as like something that needs to be fixed or, you know, improved. I need to go to the gym. LA, it's like, this is everyone, right? Like the body can always be better. It's a lifelong project. We don't want it to be bad. We want it to be good. Instead of just being like, well, what is the body? It's my experience of reality. It's my everything here. Can I learn to love it? Then there's this layer about nature relation. And this is kind of like biophilia hypothesis, you know, that humans have a fundamental urge to cultivate relationships with non-human beings because we're related to them. Mm. It fascinates me that, you know, most scientists will 
hold up Darwin's work in The Origin of Species and say that this is the cornerstone of evolutionary biology. But that text is saying that fundamentally every single plant and animal here shares a common ancestor at some point, but somewhere that gets lost in translation, that people don't really understand that fundamentally. So when people start seeing life unfolding before them and they say, oh, I'm not that different from a bird or a tree or a squirrel or whatever it is, you know, they start saying, wow, like there's a lot more similarity than there is difference, that we're all in this together, that can produce a sensation of awe. And then I think there's this final level, which I like to talk about as the imaginal. So I think before telling you about this, it's really important that you understand it's not the imaginary, it's the right. imaginal. Okay. Right. So the imaginary is like, when we purposely create a fantasy in our mind, you know, we're in control, we're curating the fantasy. But imaginal is like when something completely unexpected happens to you. And an example like that happens somewhat commonly is people feel as if a tree has communicated with them somehow. Some people will say this isn't possible. It doesn't fit within the story of science. You must be projecting, but then there's a lot of authors and mystics and scientists who have all talked about the function of the imagination is to perceive what is unseeable. There is something there. It's not something that is measurable or quantifiable, but it is real. And even if we don't wanna get into the argument about whether it's real or not, we can at least agree that if it's meaningful for someone subjectively, why does it matter whether it's real or not? So like sometimes on a forest therapy walk, people will have, um, okay. So there was this one walk I did and a woman came back, she was in tears and she told us this story about um, laying her hands on the bark of a tree and having a very kind of like instant association with her grandfather dying and feeling the, the wrinkles of his face. And she just started crying and the tree kind of received these tears and it was like they were related, they were there. It was the tree, it was her grandfather, it was her, it was the world, all coexisting together. And she said, I've never been able to grieve that loss. Hmm. So who cares whether it was real right. or not, if that was a healing and transformative experience yeah. for her, if there was beauty there, it shouldn't matter. And that I think is maybe what kind of like that defines awe for a lot of people on a level that they weren't expecting mm. to have. And like, as a guide, I'm not producing this. I'm not, you know, coercing you into having some sort of imaginal experience. It just happens, you know? So I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm in the process of digesting all these different layers, but also like thinking of a, perhaps another one, or maybe it's, it's, it's a, result of all these layers i'm thinking about the the sense of awe in, in in realizing that you're not that important yes that that you're not that you know that i'm not in center right right uh, and and that that could be like the ego death or, or or the the like the process of integrating with the wholeness but what i what i experienced in 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 Burning Man, what I sometimes experience in, in, in nature uh, and also in meditation is when I dissolve. Like right. I'm not, I'm not, there's, the pressure of existence is not on me. Right. That is like the closest I come to, to awe. Right. Or that is basically awe for me. Right. Yeah, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about interbeing, right? It's like all of a sudden I'm not me anymore. I'm enmeshed in all of this and it's enmeshed in me. It's like we imagine our bodies as a semi-permeable boundary between us and everything else, yeah. but maybe that's an illusion as well. That yeah, when we have that experience, um, I experience something very similar to what you just described and I often feel like it's kind of how Zen talks about enlightenment, that yeah. it's like a lightning flash that illuminates everything for a moment and then disappears. And you didn't control it, you didn't make it happen, it just happens. And mm. part of that is, I think it's, it's two things. It's you're not important and that I love you. Yeah. 
your home, you're where you need to be, you're, you're part of this. You're not alone. Right, you're not alone. And that's this really transcendental feeling of like, it. it's not about becoming something more than this. This moment is perfect. This moment is suspended in time. Everything is connected. I don't have to be me right now. That's kind of this incredible feeling, right? Mm. There's a... Uh, like a, there's a Japanese poet named Ikkyu who talks about there's only one koan that matters, you. <laughs> I think that's kind of the, the nature of that koan, right? You know a koan? Mm -hmm. So how do you get over this? How do you get over the koan of yourself, right? Because that's the, the trick there, yeah. right? Is you can't have it both ways. You can't have the self and have the connection to everything. You have to learn how to let go. Yeah, I had a really uh, inspiring uh, conversation with a close friend of mine, Katja, and um, we were talking about, we were, you know, as one does, we were talking about the universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just got into this, you know, um, thought about, you know, uh, the universe getting bored, mm. like my daughter. Mm. And when the universe got bored she just you know started to you know uh like almost like a child who who says to her her, her dad i'm i'm so bored i'm gonna i'm gonna hold my breath until i explode <laughs> <laughs> so the universe was like oh, i'm gonna hold my breath until i explode and then the universe exploded and then it was like this game or this you know playfulness of you know uh just exploding into pieces to be able to see herself right uh, and me as an individual me as a human being i'm both an individual and 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 part of a collective and i'm don't i don't necessarily only mean like the human collective but i'm 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 i'm, I'm something but i'm i'm also part of something like right. uh, it's the drop in the ocean well it's like biologically you're related to everything on this planet chemically or no biologically you're related to everything alive on this planet chemically you're related to everything on the planet but then atomically you're related to absolutely everything in everything the universe. right right so yeah you drop down these layers and all of a sudden the bodies that we are made out of become just the same as everything else but also i mean there's a there's a there's a function to the individual individuality there's a uh, what i realized when we were talking me and katya was that separation is beautiful mm. uh, but there's not only separation there's also unity right so we need both right so the, the the function of separation is to be able to interact with myself as the universe mm, right. and 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 but i also need to remember remember <laughs> the the part of the connectiveness and the unity but i need both right and and maybe the, the last uh, i don't know the last period of of human history we've been focusing too much on separation and individuality but it's not wrong it's just like this unbalance of it it's part of the gift of our evolution on this planet do you know where sense like the sense of separateness comes from so now this might not be a fact. Let's call this a story from the world of science. Um, so theoretically, when life on this planet began, all single celled organisms derived their energy from the sun. Mm. And so their kind of ontological or conscious experience did not demand a sense of separation because nothing was trying to eat them. They were just floating around and getting energy from the sun. Right. At a certain point in evolution, a, some sort of cellular being realized that it was more energy efficient to consume its neighbor and take that energy than it was to wait for the energy from the sun. Hmm. And in that moment, theoretically, every single cellular being all of a sudden became conscious of separation because all of a sudden it lived in a completely new world, one where it had to run away from the big things and run towards and try to consume the small things. Hmm. And that's where it all started. So our separateness is a part of, of like our ancestry, you know, coming back hmm. to that idea that we're all related. Like 
this is a fundamental part of, of who we are and how we live. I mean, it's funny to me that humans think they're so special when even things like love chemically come from an evolutionary process. Um, there's this book, The Moral Molecule, I forget the author, Zach something, Dr. Zach. He has a theory about in evolutionary biology, at some point there was this crisis with lobsters. <laughs> so apparently lobsters, they're like this ancient, you know, a very ancient species on the yeah. planet and lobsters exist in a very kind of cutthroat, dangerous world. They're hyper aggressive. They'll kill very, very unprovoked, just kill everything. So there was this problem where the female lobster has to take off her exoskeleton in order to be impregnated by the male lobster. And when she did that, the male would impregnate her and then eat her. So obviously this is a problem if you wanna continue the species. Yeah. And so the female lobster allegedly, theoretically evolved this gland that um, kind of excreted this chemical that I believe was called prototocin and it basically rewired the male lobster's brain so that instead of eating her, he would protect her hmm. until she would have the babies and then it would wear off and he'd go back to killing everything. So we now have this um, neurochemical called oxytocin, which, you know, there's like, I think a lot of misinformation about oxytocin and what it does and whatever, but oxytocin is found in breast milk and it gives children that connected feeling with their mother and it's produced by the brain when we have these like love feelings, right? But the only reason we have love feelings anyway is because of something that happened millions and millions of years ago. Like all of our chemical processes came from experiences that animals had before our species was ever even a thing. Mm. So like, yeah, what, what is the conscious experience if not a remembering of our connectedness to all the beings that came before us, not only our human ancestors, but the ancestors of, of those animals as well, deep, 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 deep into the past. Yeah, so I'm, uh, the conclusion is uh, that, that the, the, the experience of life is, is basically I love you, but I might eat you, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll eat you unless there's a reason not to. Yeah, so I, what, what I'm thinking is uh, I, I would, someday I would love to just, you know, be, be able to, I, I would love to come to one of these forest, uh, what do you call them? Forest, forest therapy. Forest therapies and just yeah. experience what we've been talking about. You should. Uh, and, and overcome my, my fear of nature. I'm not afraid of nature. I just find it a little bit hostile and chaotic, I think. Yeah. A lot uh, of people have a fear of nature and have a feeling like it's chaotic. And I think in some ways there's, I mean, there's a cultural piece to that yeah. where like, you know, a lot of like, Christian hagiography is really interesting to me because you look at like St. Patrick and this dude shows up on an island and the description is like, all the animals are frothing at the mouth and killing each other and all the trees are, have poisonous fruit and thorns. <laughs> and then the moment St. Patrick steps onto the island, a rainbow comes out and then all the trees start bearing fruit and all the animals chill out and right. are like totally fine. So there's a story in our culture about kind of the devil lives in the woods, you know, like it's a, it's a darkness, it's a scary, chaotic place. Mm. And that, that's a story that's been replicated. You know, you think about Hansel and Gretel, or like there's so many stories about like, don't go in the woods. The woods are where like there's yeah. danger. So there's that cultural feeling, but then there's also, I think something about, so like the tamed world or the default world, it has its own kind of love. And it's a love that I call paternalistic love. It's basically saying, I love you and I don't want you to get hurt. So I need you to follow the rules. Yeah. But the love of the wilderness is like a, it's a love that says, I love you so much that I'm willing to let you die or transform into whatever you need to be to become real. And that's where I think there's kind of this archetypal fear of being in nature that it's like, who am I without all of this? Who am I without my job and my car and my friends and all this? Who am I when I become that animal self? And I think there's, there's a fear about the wildness within us, mm. right? That like we've been taught to have some apprehension and some fear about our own wildness that, you know, is that a dark chaotic energy? And how do we learn to accept that as well? How do we learn to integrate that? And how do we learn to view it as part of our wholeness? 
Yeah, that resonates a lot with me. I think that's like yeah, one of the main issues. I would love to try it though. Come. So Ben, thank you so much for this conversation. We almost did two hours, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we could do another two hours. For sure, for sure. So let's leave it at that for now. Uh, and 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 uh, as I said, I will be here for another couple of weeks. So maybe we can try to do a tour. Great. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And and uh, um, I'm also wondering if uh, is there any We'll be here for another two weeks, right? So is there anyone else that would be um, interesting for us to meet? Do you, do you I'll come think to about think it. of I'll think about anyone? It. Yeah. Yeah. Let me think about it. And if, if anyone of our listeners want to uh, go on a uh, forest therapy tour with you, uh, how do they find you? Okay. So you can find information on the training at... Um, www.natureandforesttherapy.org and you can find more information on my walks here in LA at www.shinrinyokula.com it's pronounced shinin you know japanese it's very no r but shinrin s h i n r i n y o k u l a.com and how do people find you on social media ben page ben page yeah. instagram twitter Yeah, at Shinrin Yoku LA. Perfect. Perfect. So once again, thank you so much, Ben, for being on the How Can We podcast. Looking forward to talk more to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.